Preterm birth is defined by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists as delivery of an infant prior to 37 weeks gestation. There are two main types of preterm birth, spontaneous and induced. Approximately 20% of all preterm births are induced. In most cases, induction is medically necessary due to danger to the mom or fetus. 80% of preterm births are spontaneous with and without premature rupture of membranes. This talk will focus on spontaneous preterm birth. Preterm birth accounted for approximately 12.7% of live births in 2007, and this incidence has risen by greater than 20% since 1990. This increase continues despite advances in prediction and prevention of preterm birth. Premature delivery of an infant accounted for greater than 75% of fetal and neonatal deaths in babies without genetic anomalies. And infants who survive premature birth suffer significant long-term morbidity. The morbidities are most commonly secondary effects of respiratory distress syndrome, which occurs when fetal lungs fail to mature. These include bronchopulmonary dysplasia, intraventricular hemorrhage, neurodevelopmental problems, and cognitive difficulties. While numerous studies have examined potential preventative measures for preterm birth, few have been successful. Traditional treatments include hydration, bed rest, and home uterine activity monitoring, and these have a very low success rate. Tocolytic therapy aimed at stopping contraction has been used with limited success. The latest studies suggest that it could be used only to prolong pregnancy for short periods of time, but not to prevent preterm birth. A recent meta-analysis showed that 17-hydroxyprogesterone, when given beginning at 16 weeks gestation to women with a history of preterm birth, is effective in preventing preterm birth. There is insufficient evidence to support its use in any other setting, however. Therefore, in most women, the goal of therapy is to prolong pregnancy long enough to administer antenatal corticosteroids, Injection of dexamethasone or other corticosteroids at least 48 hours prior to delivery of an infant induces lung maturity and significantly reduces morbidity and mortality associated with preterm birth. Thus, it is crucial that we identify an accurate predictor of preterm birth. One reason that has been so challenging to find appropriate therapy for patients with preterm birth is that this is a diverse syndrome with numerous etiologies. Extensive literature review supports the idea that the majority of preterm births occur due to one or more of four major pathobiological processes. Each of these pathways culminates into a final common pathway that involves induction of uterine contractions and cervical changes with or without premature rupture of membranes. These pathways include induction of the maternal or fetal stress response system through activation of mom and or baby's hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Stress accounts for approximately 15% of preterm births. Inflammation of the chorion, amnion, or deciduous areas and or systemic inflammation can lead to elevation of cytokines which act on the chorionic and or deciduous surfaces to induce labor. Inflammation with or without infection accounts for the majority of preterm births, and that is up to 50% of preterm births. Decidual hemorrhage leading to detachment of the placenta, commonly called placental abruption, accounts for approximately 10% of preterm births, and in many cases is due to a bleeding or coagulation disorder. The fourth known etiology of preterm birth is pathobiological distension of the uterus due to polyhydramnios, which is too much amniotic fluid, and or a multiple gestation. These may occur simultaneously or separately. Each is a distinct pathobiological process that may respond differently to therapy. Since each etiology is different, prediction of preterm birth in women with overlapping symptoms may be very challenging. Clinical signs and symptoms of labor, including contractions, abdominal pain, and cervical dilation occur late in the process and are very nonspecific. In fact, the majority of women with labor symptoms will not deliver preterm. In women with true preterm labor, symptoms often occur too late to intervene. Therefore, there is a real need for a biochemical marker that can predict preterm birth early in the process. Genetics are a good predictor of preterm birth. A mother born prematurely at less than 30 weeks gestation has a 2.4-fold increased risk of delivering her child preterm. Further, there is a huge disparity among races. African Americans are twice as likely as Caucasians to deliver preterm. 
when other etiological and socioeconomic factors are well controlled. We're going to talk more about this later. One of the best predictors of preterm birth among multiparous pregnant women is a history of preterm birth. One prior preterm birth incurs a 15% increased risk, while two prior preterm births predispose a mother to a 32% increased risk of delivering a subsequent child preterm. This population has a therapy, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, that works and is recommended for use by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The problem is that primary predictors based on risk factors like history, socioeconomic status, lifestyle, etc., provide approximately 20% sensitivity and a positive predictive value of 30%. So alone, they are not good predictors of preterm birth. This is partially due, again, to the different etiologies of disease and partially due to the fact that half of all preterm births occur in women with no known risk factors. Cervical evaluation by digital exam is also not reliable, but there are different data indicating that measuring cervical length by transvaginal ultrasound is a good predictor of preterm birth, especially when combined with other biochemical markers. Several biomarkers and genetic factors have been tested for clinical use in predicting preterm birth, including salivary estriol and cytokines. But only fetal fibronectin is recommended by the ACOG for routine prediction of preterm birth. Fetal fibronectin is an extracellular matrix glycoprotein with significant homology to fibronectin. During pregnancy, its expression in the extracellular matrix at the junction between the maternal decidua and fetal chorionic membranes may be important for implantation and maintenance of fetal maternal attachment. Immunoassay specific for the unique oncofetal domain of fetal fibronectin can detect fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal secretions of women for the first 22 weeks of their pregnancy until the fetal membranes have completely fused to the maternal decidua. By 37 weeks gestation, fetal fibronectin becomes more heavily glycosylated, loses its adhesive properties, and can again be detected in cervical vaginal secretions. Fetal fibronectin is thought to be present in cervical vaginal fluid during spontaneous preterm labor as a result of mechanical separation of the chorion from the decidual membrane or sloughing or secretion in response to chronic local inflammation. The clinical utility of fetal fibronectin is in its high negative predictive value. Specifically, a negative test is a good predictor of women who will not deliver within 14 days of testing. As mentioned in the previous slide, fetal fibronectin is detectable in cervical vaginal secretions during the first 22 weeks of pregnancy. Its expression pattern by gestational week is depicted here. Typically, fetal fibronectin expression is undetectable in cervical vaginal fluid between gestational weeks 24 and 35. Numerous studies have reported that a cervical vaginal fluid fetal fibronectin concentration greater than 50 nanograms per mil between 24 and 34 weeks, six days gestation is associated with an increased risk for preterm delivery in both symptomatic and asymptomatic women. In the laboratory, fetal fibronectin is measured using a rapid semi-quantitative assay or a manual enzyme immunoassay. Both assays use a proprietary antibody manufactured by Hologic and the test is FDA approved for the following settings. In women with symptoms of preterm labor who are between 24 and 34 weeks, six days gestation, fetal fibronectin measurements can detect with reasonable certainty women who will not deliver within seven or 14 days of testing. The high negative predictive value of almost 99% allows physicians to send patients home instead of admitting them to the hospital. The clinical utility of fetal fibronectin in asymptomatic women is less clear. The manufacturer states that in women with a history or other clinical suspicion of preterm birth, measurement of fetal fibronectin every two weeks helps to assess a woman's risk for delivering prior to 35 weeks gestation. The negative predictive value in this population is approximately 96%. In each case, the positive predictive value is very low at 15%. Clinicians have a difficult time deciding how to act on a positive fetal fibronectin test result. Fetal fibronectin is also contraindicated in several situations, many of which occur in women with preterm labor, including advanced cervical dilation, premature rupture of amniotic membranes, in women with cervical cerclage, vaginal bleeding, or a history of sexual intercourse within 24 hours of testing. The problem with fetal fibronectin is that even in symptomatic women, only about 5% will actually deliver preterm. 
Any diagnostic marker would demonstrate a similar negative predictive value because the prevalence of disease is so low. The negative predictive value of a coin flip in a disease with a 5% prevalence is 95%. What we actually need is a biomarker with a high positive predictive value. Because of its presence in inflammatory disease, we and others sought to investigate whether interleukin-6 or IL-6 measured in cervical vaginal fluid would be a better predictor of women who would deliver preterm. 50% of preterm births are associated with infection or inflammation. If left untreated, infections of the amniotic cavity can lead to chorioamnionitis. This is a serious infection which is rarely identified in pregnancy because few women have clinical symptoms, only about 12.5%. Most often, chorioamnionitis is diagnosed through a pathological evaluation of the placenta. In patients with chorioamnionitis, there is a fourfold increased risk of neonatal mortality. This is in part due to the increased risk of preterm birth. Chorioamnionitis triggers expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in turn signal the release of prostaglandins to induce cervical ripening and uterine contractions. Because of their presence during chorioamnionitis and their role in the pathobiology of disease, cytokines measured in both cervical vaginal and amniotic fluids have been investigated as potential biomarkers for prediction of preterm birth. Among them, cervical vaginal fluid IL-6 has shown the most promise. How does this compare to fetal fibronectin testing? We recently performed a large multicenter trial looking at the diagnostic utility of fetal fibronectin and IL-6 measured in cervical vaginal fluid to predict preterm birth within 14 days of fetal fibronectin testing. The study utilized 725 samples from 660 women with and without symptoms of labor. Positive results for both markers were significantly associated with delivery of an infant within 14 days of fetal fibronectin testing. Interestingly, IL-6 performed similarly to fetal fibronectin in that both had a high negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value was low. Likelihood ratios are actually a better estimate of a diagnostic accuracy of a biomarker. In this case, the positive likelihood ratio depicts how likely a positive test result is associated with preterm birth, while a negative likelihood ratio describes how likely a negative test result is associated with a full-term birth. A test with a strong diagnostic accuracy in a rule-out situation has a negative likelihood ratio of less than 0.1, while a positive likelihood ratio is greater than 10 in a test with a strong ability to rule in disease. As you can see, neither fetal fibronectin nor IL-6 are strong diagnostic markers to rule in or out preterm birth. Why are we unable to find a good diagnostic marker for preterm birth? One thought is that this is a complex syndrome with different underlying etiologies. This argument is supported in recent literature looking at racial disparities in preterm birth. As I mentioned earlier, the overall prevalence of preterm birth has increased by 20% in the last 20 years. Interestingly, when broken up by race, this is not a global phenomenon. Since 1990, a significant increase, approximately 35%, has been observed in the Caucasian population. This increase is attributed to increases in rates of assisted reproductive technology and multiple gestations. Surprisingly, the prevalence has remained largely unchanged among African Americans. Why is this rate of preterm birth so much higher in African Americans? And why the continued disparity? Some suggest differences in socioeconomic status, time at presentation for obstetrics care, and or the prevalence of early teen pregnancies. However, studies show that the disparities in preterm birth rates still exist when socioeconomic status and other risk factors are normalized, suggesting an underlying genetic difference that predisposes African American women to increased risk of preterm birth. Preliminary studies on the topic have demonstrated differential protein expression for some cytokines, including IL-6, in amniotic fluid of women who delivered preterm. These differences in protein expression correspond with differences in single nucleotide polymorphisms present in cytokine genes between African American and Caucasian women. Do these differences translate to differences in diagnostic utility of fetal fibronectin and IL-6 among different races? In a large multicenter study in which patients were divided by race, fetal fibronectin and Caucasian and IL-6, the African American population showed improved diagnostic strength with positive likelihood ratios greater than five, indicating a test with moderate rule-in ability. 
This finding makes sense when we consider recent literature demonstrating a genetic difference between African American and Caucasian women who deliver preterm based on a large-scale single nucleotide polymorphism analysis. These studies were the first to suggest a genetic predisposition to etiology of preterm birth. In the population studied, preterm birth in African American women was most often due to infection or inflammation, while preterm birth in Caucasian women was due to hematological or cervical disease, as well as inflammation. Currently, experts in the field believe that preterm birth results from complex interactions between genes and environment. Therefore, the best predictor of preterm birth may be one that accounts for race and etiology. Nationally, we are faced with the epidemic of increasing preterm birth rates despite significant research into prediction and prevention. Part of the problem is that we don't have a complete understanding for the underlying pathophysiologies leading to preterm labor and birth. Further, we continue to struggle with prediction of which pregnant women with and without symptoms of preterm labor will deliver preterm. The presence of IL-6 or fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal fluid may indicate an increased risk for preterm delivery. However, these markers are nonspecific. The absence of IL-6 or fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal fluid of women with and without symptoms of labor is an excellent predictor of women who will not deliver preterm, with negative predictive values greater than 98%. But in a low prevalence disease like preterm birth, this is not much better than a coin flip. Recent evidence suggests that genetic differences between African-American and Caucasian women who deliver preterm lead to completely different pathobiological processes of disease. Prediction of preterm birth may require a different kind of analysis, one looking at the interaction of multiple markers secreted in different pathobiological processes by patients of different racial or ethnic backgrounds.